Let's get right into the Word today, and uh, uh, we have been in this great series, Where Do I Start? Today I want to talk to you about, very simply, I've got one point, so it's going to be, but there's some fill-ins, and I want you to kind of work with me. I want to talk to you about get ready to rumble. And uh, as we start our series, and, and we've started, and last week we talked about the fact that it all starts in the wrong way with a lie. And lies we believe and lies we tell ourselves. And instead of embracing and searching for the truth, we buy the lie and we find ourselves in a continued cycle of, uh, 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 of dysfunctional thinking and behavior. So what I want to do today, I want to start the journey because there's no way we can do all of this in, in one or even two Sundays. So I want to start this journey and kind of change the direction a little bit. We'll kind of recap a little bit and kind of change our direction. But really, the question is, if, if, if I'm going to have healthy thinking, uh, two questions. What does it look like and what can I expect? How many of you know that it's easy to decide to make a change? It's another thing to act, actually guide yourself through the process of change. It's one thing to say, making a decision today and say, I'm going to make some changes. It's another thing to manage that decision. Because making a decision is one thing, but managing a decision is another. I can make a decision say, well, okay, Henny, uh, look in the mirror. Uh, you know, you're a little bit pudgy, you know, a little pleasantly plump. And uh, you need to lose some weight. I'm just using that example because I, I really look good. Uh, um, but, you know, just look at that and say, okay, there's some things I need to work on. So I can make that decision today. But how many of you know I've got to manage that decision this afternoon when I walk out of these doors and grab a couple of hot dogs? So now I have to manage. Now I have a decision. Am I going to grab two hot dogs or just one? And I know I'm only allowed one, so I need to obey the rules and only grab one. But, you know, there will be a tendency when everybody's left, when there's a few hot dogs left over, that I want to take some of those home. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So that's when I have to manage the decision that I made in order to bring about the change that I desire. So look at our key verse again, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. It says this, look closely at yourselves, test yourselves to see if you are living in the faith. Now last week we ended with the, these verses in 2 Corinthians 10, and I want to start with them today. Go with me to 2 Corinthians 10. I'm going to read them both out of the message translation and as well as a, out of the New Living Translation, because there's some words that I want to emphasize, and it's going to be my emphasis as we work through this. Look at this. Uh, lo, notice what he writes, 2 Corinthians 10, and let's pick it up. We use our uh, powerful God tools for smashing. Somebody say smashing. smashing. Say no, say it louder. Smashing. Say it like you want to smash something. Smashing. Okay, imagine your husband say, no, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm teasing. Watch this, tearing down. Somebody say tearing down. Barriers erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of life shaped by Christ. Our tools are ready at hand for clearing the ground. Say, clearing the ground. Watch this. Every obstruction and building lives. Say, building lives of obedience into maturity. Now, go with me to the same passage out of the New Living Translation. And listen to what he talks about. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down. Somebody say, knock down. The strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy, say destroy, destroy. false arguments, we destroy, say destroy, destroy, every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture, somebody say capture, capture, their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. And after you become fully obedient, we will punish, somebody say punish, punish. everyone who remains disobedient. Now, I, I don't know if you get the drift of what Paul is communicating here to us. But if you do get the grip, you'll understand. Just listen to these words again. Smashing, tearing down, clearing the ground. The New, uh, new uh, Living Translation uses these words. Knock down, destroy, capture, punish. Does these sound like fighting words to you? Yeah. Come on, does it sound like fighting words? Yeah. You better believe it and you better know it. The problem with some of us, we want to keep our dysfunction as a pet and feed it from time to time. The only problem with that is, is that we find out too late that the pet we have been feeding is a poisonous snake and that it's escaped its cage. Now, in celebration of Black History Month, I've got a quote uh, from uh, Harriet Tubman who led the Underground uh, Railroad and led people to freedom. And she was a devout woman of faith uh, who, despite her own peril, put her life on the line for others continuously. And she has a quote, and uh, I, I'm kind of giving you this quote, but I think it's a powerful quote because it really applies to what we ought to do. Listen to what she says. I love this. Never wound a snake, kill it. 
Never wound a snake. Kill it. Now, I know she had a little bit more to it than what I'm talking about, but there, there's, a, there's a reality in this. Let me just tell you a story uh, about a guy that had a pet python, and um, he had this pet python that, that you know, got it very small, and, and what he would do with it, he would take it out of its cage, and he would feed it, and, and he had it for, for a long, long time. And this python kept on growing, and eventually it outgrew the cage that he had. And uh, so and, and, uh, um, what he would do is he would have the pet python there on his couch, and he would lie there on his couch, and the pet python would be there lying next to him. And, and uh, he, ha he had him for, for you know, a long, long time, and the python kept on growing, growing. And then uh, um, after a while, he saw that the python started adapting some really strange behavior. As he was lying on the couch, the python would come lie on the couch, and the python would stretch himself out next to him. And he just kind of stretched himself out. And, and uh, he was noticing this behavior, and he was wondering, you know, what's going on? And, you know, he didn't think much of it. But he, this, this kind of behavior from the python kept on happening again and again and again. So uh, he, after a while, he thought, man, i got to find out. So he had a friend that was a, a herpetologist. And he called him on the phone, and he said, hey, listen, I just want to, you know, uh, I just want to run some things by you here real quick. And he talked a little bit about some things, and then he said, you know, uh, my pet python, he said, yeah, it's your pet python, he's probably large, but I said, yeah. He says, you know, he's got very strange behavior right now. I said, well, what is he doing? He says, well, he's kind of cuddling with me. He says, what do you mean he's cuddling with you? He says, well, I mean, I, whenever I, you know, whenever I lie on the couch, he would come, and he lies next to me, and then he kind of stretches himself out. And uh, the herpetologist on the other line literally screamed, say, hey! And he's like, what do you mean, hey? He said, he's not cuddling with you, he's measuring you for a meal. All right. True story. He's not cuddling with you, he's measuring you for a meal. You see, when we keep on allowing the dysfunctions in our lives and we keep on feeding it, eventually they will consume us. Please understand this today. You have got to get this. If you don't listen to anything else I'm saying, listen to this. We will have to fight because we are in the fight for our lives. Our battle is not against people, but against strongholds, warped human reasoning, lies and false arguments, pridefully built obstacles against the knowledge of God, as well as rebellious thoughts and willful disobedience. Now, all these things are constructed within human minds, including our own. They're inspired by thoughts that are contrary to the truth. We live in a culture conducive to everything goes, and your truth is not my truth. Nevertheless, we cannot allow this to be the way we think, feel, and the way we live. So we have to contend first and foremost within ourselves that we are building our lives upon the truth of God's Word and not allow our minds to be shaped or squeezed into the mold or culture of what we live in. Listen to Romans 12, verse 2 out of the J.B. Phillips translation. He says this. Don't let the world around you do what? Squeeze. Come on, say it loud. Squeeze. Squeeze you into its mold. But let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove in practice that the plan for God for you is good, meets all the demands, and moves toward the goal of true maturity. Now, we know that we're in a war. We've got to recognize, first and foremost, if you're going to make some changes in your life, it is going to have to take everything you've got. It's going to be a fight. You're going to have to fight through it because there's, there's a tendency for us to start and not finish. There's a tendency for us for wanting to end something and change something, but then eventually we go back to and revert back to previous behavior and previous dysfunctions. The second thing I want you to understand, write this in your notes, you realize that you know we're a number, whatever number, the battlefield is the mind. The battlefield, the place of your battle is the mind. Again and again and again. I want, to, I want to read this to you as we approach this topic today. Out of 1 Peter 4 verse 1, listen to what Peter says. Uh, listen to the words. The words are important. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, now listen to the language. Arm yourselves. Somebody say, arm myself. Arm myself. What must I arm myself? Arm yourselves also with the same what? Mind. Mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. Now, why would Peter write and tell us to arm ourselves if we don't need to fight? What is the purpose of arms? It is to defend ourselves against a potential enemy. 
Now notice he says we arm ourselves by thinking the same way Jesus did. And by thinking the same way Jesus did about what? Listen to the language. About suffering. Oh, I can feel you already. I mean, I just feel you already. You say, come on, any suffering? Not any kind of suffering. I'm not talking about your backache kind of suffering here. You have backache, I'm suffering for Jesus. I'm not talking about that. Are you with me? The suffering that he's referring to is the way that Jesus suffered because he suffered and died for our sin. So what he is saying, he wants us to understand that we have to arm our minds, we have to allow our minds to know that there's a battle that we are going to have against the sinful nature within us. Yes, Jesus has overcome, and because he's overcome, we know that we can win the battle. We can win it as well. But the suffering is the suffering against that fight against the flesh that you are always going to have in your life. Why? So that you can end up doing the will of God. Is anybody in this room wanting to do the will of God? If you want to do the will of God, it's not just going to fall on you. It doesn't happen by osmosis. It doesn't happen by somebody laying their hands on you and praying over you. And now suddenly you're going to do the will of God. You're going to have to contend for it. You're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to dream about it. You're going to have to search for it. You're going to have to reach for it beyond where you are at. Now, how do I know this? Because there's a word that's important that he uses in 1 Peter 4, the first verse. He said the word therefore. And when, you're, when you look at the word therefore, it's always therefore for a reason. What is it therefore? Go back to the previous verse. Notice what he says in verse 22 of, of 1 Peter 3. He says this. Now, Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God. And all the angels and authorities and powers accept his authority. If you want to live God's kingdom culture, you are going to have to be willing to suffer the loss of some things in your life. You will have to be willing to let the Holy Spirit control your thinking and not your own lustful desires. There is without a doubt a suffering to do what is right. Now, I mean, let's just talk about this. Doing wrong is easy because it comes with zero effort. I'm not talking to anybody in this room. How many of you are like me? I mean, doing wrong is easy for me. Don't be so excited about that. I'm just I'm just letting you in on it. But doing right, when I have to make a choice between doing that which is right and doing that, you know, which is not right, the, the not right one always looks like the easiest path because it's the path of least resistance. The, the difficult part is I have to contend for the good against the bad. When I have to choose certain things over other things, there is, a, there is a suffering that is attached to it. There is a war that's attached to it that I have to be willing to push through to get to the other side of it. But it all stems from the fact that I have to recognize not only I'm in a war, but I have to recognize that my mind is the battleground. And where I'm going to allow who is going to have the control of what I think about is going to have the control of what I act on again and again and again. Look at this verse with me in Romans 8 verse 5 to 7. Watch this. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature, none of them come to first service, we know. Watch this. Think about what? Sinful things. So those who are dominated, that means that's the way they act. What are they thinking about? All right. You know, the reason you don't know is because you don't do that. But watch this. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit, think about things that what? Please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind. Leads to what? Death. Death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to what? Life and peace. peace. Isn't that what we all want? For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and it never... Come on now, somebody. So then the question is... What arms must I place within my mind? I'm going to give you that one thought today because that's where we'll start. How to prepare our minds for action. How to prepare our minds for this, for this war that we are in. There's, there's one thought I want to give you. Write this in. You have to arm your mind with possibility thinking. You have to arm your mind with possibility thinking. Now, you have to believe that change is not only necessary, but that it is possible. Many of us have, that have been in circumstances and situations that have never seemed to change, we, we have lost what I call hope because we feel trapped. Almost, it's almost like clockwork, a cycle that comes and trips us up the moment we try to make any change. But you have to believe that you have to tell yourself that change is possible, that it's okay to acknowledge that it is hard, but remember there's a big difference between being hard and being impossible. 
Something that's hard might seem impossible, but it's not. And sometimes it's hard because you run into obstacles again and again. We need a habit of possible thinking. Now, it is more than just staying positive. So that's not what I'm saying. It is seeing the possibility even within the difficulty. It is being hopeful for a better outcome than the one that is being predicted. So, so maybe you're saying, well, you know what? If I keep on walking this path, this is where it's going to end up. But possibility thinking says, no, I can change not only where I'm at, I can change where I'm going to end up. I can change not only where I am. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's a challenge. Yes, it's a fight. But I believe that if I do what God tells me to do, if I change my mind by thinking spirit-controlled thoughts, then I'm going to end up where God has me. It's painting a different picture than the present situation I find myself in. If you allow your present condition to determine what you are going to do, you will always act in hopelessness. You cannot let your present circumstance predict your future. Jesus said all things are possible to him who believes. Peter says that possibility thinking allows us to be prepared for victory. Possibility does not just say be positive, be positive, be positive, be positive, be positive. I can be positive. How many of you know? How many have tried that? Does it work? No. I mean, maybe for a moment. Possibility sees. Here's what it sees. It sees the way out. It ceases the opportunity to engage our faith on a higher level. Now, it is not the ignoring of the facts. It's the acknowledgement of the greatness of God. If all things are possible to Him, then I can allow my mind to think that which is possible for me. So even though I might not be that, I might not be there yet, I might not have arrived there yet, I can think about the fact that it's all it's possible. It's possible to change. It's possible to engage. And I engage my mind in that. Look what, what Peter writes in the first chapter of the same book. Watch this. 1 Peter 1.13. Notice these words. So prepare your minds for what? Oh, my goodness. Does that sound like you got a fight going on? you got to prepare your minds for what? For action. I mean, there's this engagement happening here. And watch this. He adds, and exercise what? He puts the one before the other. You prepare your mind for action, and what follows? Self-control. Because you got to have that. What? Put all your hope. Somebody say hope. hope. In the grace of salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. Hope feeds your faith and helps you to have the ammunition to arm your mind. Hope is ammunition for your mind. The problem, however, is that persistent failure and lack of progress and change leads us to a place where we abandon our hope. I mean, it's very difficult when you're believing God for a change in your relationship, a change in your marriage, and nothing changes and you're already 15 years in. How many of you understand that? And, and I mean, some of you are even longer in than that. And you've been in, in the same rubbish, the same stuff for the last 20 plus years. The same way, nothing seemed to change. How many of you know it's very difficult to hold out hope when the behavior of other people are continually not the way you want it? And what happens is then maybe for a season you responded the right way, but it's very difficult to, to continue responding the right way when others are not acting the right way. Boy, I'm preaching good this morning. <laughs> See, there's a pattern of behavior that no matter how hard you've tried, you just can't shake it. Whether it is a habit, a hurt, a hang-up. Now, I want you to turn with me to Psalm 19. I want to do this real quick as, because I want to get somewhere. Uh, watch this. In Psalm 19, we see David talk about the perfect revelation of God. And he talks about the greatness. He talks about creation in the first several verses. And he talks about how awesome God is. And then he switches gears in verse 12. Because he talks about, uh, uh, before that, in, in verse uh, 10 to 11, he talks about the power of the Word of God. And he tells us how perfect the law of God is, how just the law of God is. And then as he talks about that, he switches the language. And now he's no longer focusing just on God. He's no longer just focusing on the Word of God. He changes the emphasis to himself. Now watch. Listen to what he says in verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Talking about man. Cleanse me from what? Secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sin. Let them not have, listen to the language, let them not have what? Dominion over me. Let them not rule over me. Let them not win the battle. Let them not win the fight. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of what? 
great transgression. There's a progression there that maybe we'll touch on uh, later on. If not one time, we will. But watch this. Then in verse 14, he ends with this. It's not in your notes. I'm giving this for free, no payment involved. Watch. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and redeemer. So he ends up, he, he works in the process, talking about the greatness of God. Then he talks about the power of the word of God. Then he flips that and he talks about himself. And here's what he talks about. Some secret stuff. Some stuff that he's been hiding. Some, some stuff that's been really dead down. Some presumptuous sin. Some things that he's made assumptions on that lead him to great transgression. And we know that he had some great transgression in his life. But then he says, I'm allowing God to bring about the change in my life. Why? Because I want to be delivered so that the word of God is in my mouth and in my what? Meditation. My thinking. This is throughout Scripture. Look at Psalm 90 verse 8. And you know all of our sins, even those we do in hmm. Luke 8, 17. For all that is what? Secret will eventually be brought into the open. And everything that is concealed will be brought to light and made known to all. If you don't believe that, all you need to do is watch the news. Stuff that happened 25, 30 years ago. Come on now, somebody. Stuff that, that people have done in secret. And now suddenly it's being revealed. You see, there's a tendency for us as human beings not to want to deal with reality. We love to escape or deny as long as possible before we start dealing with what is wrong in our lives. Now, last week we talked about denial, and we think by avoiding and denying that we, we have a problem, and it will somehow magically get better. I've got bad news for you. It won't. If you don't deal with the issue, it will not get better. Why do we struggle so much with facing the truth? I think one of the, the reasons are, is that truth in the first appearance always seem negative. Why? Because truth challenges us to change. And, and you have to have an honest look. Like we said from out the series, you have to have an honest look where you are right now. And the first thing you have to do is you have to define your reality. Because until you face the problem, you'll never be able to see how God can take you through it. You'll never be able to have arm yourself with possibility thinking when you refuse to deal with that which is right in front of you. The challenge for us, though, is that we have been in this bondage so long that we accept our dysfunctional behavior as a normal part of living. And once you do that, you are trapped in what I call a cycle of despondency. And this is something that I wrote down. I want you to fill this in in your notes. Here's how this cycle works. How do I know if I'm trapped in a cycle of despondency? Here's how it works. Are you ready? Yeah. That's right. You deny there is a problem. Now, the classic response, can, can we put our pretty pictures up there? The classic response is this response. All right? Do you see that response? Look at this. Now show the real one I want to show. There we go. That, that's the real one. That's our classic response. When we, when we, when we sense the pressure is a little bit on, well, well, there's really no problem. I don't really have an issue. We, we think that if we don't acknowledge it, that somehow magically it's going to just go away. Now, can, can I tell you who are the prime culprits in this? Men. Now look at the boys. They ain't not like... We light you up to that point, now come on. <laughs> Men are way more susceptible to live in denial than women. I've, I've, I've talked to too many women that have come through my office through the years, especially when I used to, and I'm putting the emphasis, used to do counseling. <laughs> how, how they would come, and, and they would come first. Because she, she, the, the wife will always tell me, this, we have been struggling with this for the last whatever plus years. For the last 15 years of our marriage. And I'm like, well, where's he? Well, he doesn't believe we have an issue. <laughs> and it is so, this has happened so many times, I cannot even mention it. How many times that the only time he deals with it is what happens. I drive up to the office and then suddenly I see somebody pacing up and down in the front door. And then as I open my car, I got to talk to you, I got to talk to you, I got to talk to you. What happened? She left me. And then suddenly now, the reality of that which has happened, now suddenly the sucker's like, well, maybe something is wrong. She obviously wasn't happy. 
No, she's been begging you and asking you for 20 plus years so that you can work through the process of getting healthier, but you just, I got no problems. Psych, I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> Cycle of despondency, you deny there is a problem. Now, by the way, just, just for truth's sake, you know, Asha just do not put their, their heads in the sand to hide from predators like, you know, th that's just a fallacy. They, and they don't really put their heads in the sand. They do furrow a little bit, and so it looks like, because it's desert sand, uh, an ostrich cannot leave uh, his or her head under the sand. They'll, they won't be able to breathe. They'll die, just so that you know. Uh, an ostrich is very, very fast. And can run away from most predators. And some ostriches have actually killed lions because they can kick pretty hard. You don't, you don't ever want to be kicked by an ostrich. We'll bury you. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so, so it's not, I mean, ostriches get a bad rap. It's, oh, you like an ostrich? No, no. It looks like it. It appears like it. The ones who do hide is us, human beings. Okay? So you deny there's a problem. Here's another one. Are, are you ready for this? You refuse help from others. You refuse help from others. There are people that you know that you can talk to who can help you or, or some resources that's available to you, but you refuse help. I, I, this, this is one of the, the, the things that blow my mind that we create avenues where people can get help. We have an incredible, let me just talk about marriage here for a moment. We have an incredible XO conference coming up. It is an incredible opportunity, whether your marriage is good, great, average, or, or, you know, bad. It's a great opportunity to come and learn. And then be like, should I, should I not, and then should I? I mean, come on now. You, you know, let me tell you something. 59 bucks for two people, and you get fed. Hello? Something's wrong with that picture when you drop at least 200 plus bucks on a Lakers ticket, but you won't invest $59 in your relationship with your spouse. Because here's what you're going to have to drop late on. You're going to have to pay 150 to 250 bucks an hour for a counselor to try to rescue what you've damaged. All because you do not make, there are things available to you to get you some help. We have incredible small groups that are starting this week. We have an incredible marriage ministry on Friday nights. There, there's a vibe. There's, it's a life. If you're a man and you've got something, we've got incredible men's ministry that meet every single week. We, we've got an incredible class, our I Cherish class that we just had this last week that is coming every single month that you can go to, that you can invest, not just because you have problems, but you can invest. And you can kind of build some, some, some relational equity within that in order to make a difference. How do you know you're in a cycle of despondency when you refuse help from others? Are you okay out there? Is this too much on Super Bowl Sunday? Should we, should we just celebrate? Hey, listen, most of our teams are not in, so we might as well deal with reality. Except for the Rams. Oh, we, there's Ron. Ron, you came to church. That's awesome. You're going to need all the help today, my friend. Are you ready for the next one? Yeah. Cycle of despondency. You deny there's a problem. You refuse help from others. You feel guilt and shame. You feel guilt and shame. And, and I'm not talking about a momentary. There's a continual feeling of guilt and shame. How many of you know guilt is okay to recognize something, but you can't stay there? Shame is something that immobilizes you. So you have to work through that process. Here's another one. You disregard the pain that it's causing you and others. How do you know you're in a cycle of despondency? You disregard the pain that it's causing you and others. You, you, you have people around you that are, that are going through struggles because of that kind of uh, 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 habit in your life, because of that kind of functioning in your life, because of that kind of thinking in your life, because of that kind of behavior in your life. Are you ready for two more? Can I give you two more? Yeah. Cycle of despondency. Let me give you two more. You get angry when someone close to you raises the issue or when Pastor Henny preaches about it on Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> Why can't he just preach about the love of God for Pete's sake? You get uncomfortable. Why? Because at sensitive issues, you immediately get defensive and you start putting up walls. Someone told me once that if you throw a shoe in a pack of dogs, the one that yelps is the one that was hit. 
So sometimes we yelp, it's because it's exactly, we are standing right there. We are the one that have to work through the process. And you get angry. How many of you know that the, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God? You just because you are, and we get offended, we put up walls instead of saying, wait a minute, there is truth here that I need to receive in order to bring about change. And let me, let me give you one more. This is bad. This is when you are trapped and you struggle to get out of this. You accept it as a way of life. Why? Because you've now built these dysfunctions to such a place where you say, well, that's just the way I am. I'm never going to change, and this is never going to get any better. The reality is we start expecting that as a way of life and start accepting it as a way of life, and, there's, and we feel that there's nothing we can do about it, and here's what happens. We lose hope, and let me say this. You need hope in order to cope. There is, you cannot change without hope. You cannot. You will not. Why? Because hope is the picture of the future. And you are always going to, listen to me, you are always going to move towards the picture you paint within your mind. So if you paint a picture of failure, paint a picture of despondency, paint a picture of, oh, I'll never be anything, I'll never get there, we'll never arrive there, then guess what? You will always be, you will literally what I call self-sabotage. You will sabotage yourself in order not to be able to what you need to reach. Why? Because you have impossibility thinking within your mind, and it's not what you need to arm your mind with. And you cannot move beyond that. And this is the cycle that keeps on repeating itself. Now, there are glimmers of hope here, glimmers of hope there. Maybe you hear a sermon here. Maybe you go to a seminar there, and there's glimmers of hope. But you refuse to understand that this is a battle that you're going to have to fight. This is progress you're going to have to make. And sometimes not even on a daily basis, sometimes on an hour-by-hour -hour basis. Because you're trying to move towards that which you desire for your future. And this you can apply. Let me tell you something. I'm giving you some stuff you pay $2,000 for right now. If you can just apply this in your life, this is God's word to help us, get us to where we need to be. I don't care where you find yourself today. I don't care what circumstance you're in. I don't care how bad things are today. If you would make a decision and believe that God can bring about the change and allow your mind to be transformed by the word and the will of God and start to paint a hopeful picture, I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you slept. I don't care what you snorted. I don't care what you smoked. I don't, I don't care what you smell. I don't care how you smell. I don't care who you slept with. I don't care what you did and what you didn't do. But if you would decide today that I am going to on my mind, I'm going to start doing things God's way, and I'm going to think that it is possible to change. Yes, it might not be a moment, it might not be a week, it might not be a month, but I am going to change by the grace and the mercy of God. I'm going to be able to do it. Why? Because He is the one who enables me to do it. Don't accept it as a way of life. What do you want from God? What do you want Him to do for you? Now, if you see several of these things in your life, specifically related to an area of dysfunction, you are trapped in the cycle of despondency, and you, you cannot begin to move forward until you first have established where you are and where you need to go, locating yourself. Now, you have to prepare your mind with the fact that it's possible to change. Because you, Why? Because your hope is not in a system. Your hope is not in a process. Your hope is not in a formula or even in a plan. Your hope is in a person, and that person is Jesus, who sits at the right hand of God the Father. That's what Peter writes when he says, therefore arm your minds. The very verse before, he says, because even the angels accept his authority, because he's sitting at the right hand of God the Father. So because of where he sits, because of where he is, I can allow my mind to be armed with the thinking that, yes, I can change. Not only can, yes, I will. And I will work through the process of becoming the woman, of becoming the man, not me becoming a woman, of becoming the man, of becoming the woman that God wants me to be. Work with me, somebody. Are, are, you, are you getting it? Now, go with me real quick. In Mark 10, 51, there's a blind man by the name of Bartimaeus, and this will help us illustrate this. He was sitting by the wayside, and he, he, was, he was begging. And he heard that Jesus was coming along. And you know the story, or maybe if you don't, you can read it this afternoon. And he begins to cry out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And, and at first they say, dude, you need to shut up. Be quiet. They're trying to quiet him down, but he knows, and he begins to cry out even louder. So here's what Jesus does. He walks over, and he stands, and he, cry, and he, and he calls out to him. 
And listen to what Jesus, Jesus asked him a question. Watch this in Mark 10, 51. Jesus asked, what do you want me to do for you? Now let's say that. Say, what, what? do you want me to do for you? Now stop there and think about this for just one moment. Everybody knows that this sucker is blind. The Bible tells us that he is blind. The Bible even calls him blind Bartimaeus. The Bible says that he had a cloak that he wore, which was his, his basically in those days his social security of the day. That means he, by him wearing that cloak, it made sure that at the end of the day, at the end of his begging, he was allowed to beg in the, within the Jewish system. He was allowed to beg because he had this cloak. This cloak gave him the validity to beg. But not only that, it assured him at the end of the day, if he did not have enough, that he would receive a square meal for that day. And not only that, it was his livelihood. His cloak was as license for him to beg. So everybody knew that he was blind. Jesus knew that he was blind. But Jesus wanted to hear from Bartimaeus. He wanted Bartimaeus to tell him what he really wanted. Oh, tell me what you want, what you really, really want. What do you want? <laughs> now, Bartimaeus could have said... Well, you know what? This standing up and sitting down, my legs are really sore. I stub my toe. You know I can't see. And I've got this big old swelling in my toe. Would you heal my big toe? I guarantee you, Jesus would have met Bartimaeus right there with his big toe and healed his big toe. But Bartimaeus wanted more than that. And he said, Lord, that I might see. And Jesus said, according to your faith, let it be unto you. Why? Because Jesus will respond to the area or place that we are willing to be vulnerable in. And it's the same with us. In your notes, fill this in. Jesus will respond to the place of our vulnerability and the level of our expectancy. The areas that you are not vulnerable in, God cannot help you. And if God can't help you, nobody else can either. The blind man answered, Master, I want to see. You see, somehow we have allowed the enemy of our faith to lie to us, to say that you, you can't really admit a weakness. You can't really admit a, a, a problem. And I think, and here's why. I don't want to drop too much here as we end this, but, but I think here's why. I think one of, one of the challenges that we have as human beings is that we have tied our self-worth to our behavior. Listen to what I said. We tie our self-worth to our behavior. Now, there's a great truth in doing good and feeling good. That is a truth. But somehow we have ourselves convinced that if I fess up to a wrong, it makes me worth less. Can I tell you something? It's just quite the opposite. You see, when you truly come to a place, that's exactly what repentance is, is to say, I've been going in the wrong direction. I want to change my direction, and I want to go in the opposite direction. Why? Because I'm arming my mind with a possibility thinking. I'm arming my mind with what is possible, not with what is. Always remember, we do not fight out of fear, we fight out of faith. Because it's not because, I, 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 I got to fight because I'm afraid what might happen if not. That's, not. that's not the position I'm fighting from. I'm fighting from the position that I'm seated with him in heavenly places. He's seated at the right hand of God. So I'm fighting from a place of authority, not a place of devaluation. I'm not fighting from the place of my self-worth because my self-worth is not tied to my behavior. It's tied to what he's done for me. My value has been determined not by what I have done because if I determine my value by what I've done, then guess what? It's not going to amount to much. But my worth is tied to what he did for me. And he said I was so valuable that he died for me. That's where my value was determined. So because my value is determined in Calvary, therefore I can work through the process of change in my life and I don't have to allow something that is a dysfunction to become an identity. Because my identity is not in my dysfunction. It is not in my behavior. It's not when other people are just, this is who you are. It's not in the label I carry. It's what he makes me. You have a choice today. 
Will I have a hot dog or won't I? No, that's not the choice. <laughs> that's a minor one. You really have a choice today. Are you going to continue in your cycle of despondency that feeds your dysfunction, keep it in secret, so that eventually that pet python will come and strangle you because he's preparing you for a meal? Or are you going to expose that stuff and bring it to the light and get the help you need and get healed? Let me close with this verse. We read it earlier, Romans 8, 6, about our minds. Watch this. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to what? Yeah. Is that what we want? No. no, of course not. But letting the Spirit. Somebody say, letting the Spirit. Letting the Spirit. Do you notice that your will is involved in that? Yeah. Letting means to allow. You have to allow. God doesn't come and, and, for, God, God doesn't come and jump on you like a Kremlin. <laughs> Think right. Yes, some thoughts. In Revelation, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. He's not talking to sinners here. He's writing this to the church. He says, I stand in the door and knock. Jesus is saying, Open up. We can have some fellowship. Allow the truth to walk through the door of your heart and sit down with you and have a conversation about where you act to give you hope. He doesn't shame you. He doesn't guilt you. He empowers you to make a change. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to what? Life and? How many of you want that? I, mean, I just want, I want life and I want what? I want peace, man. I want peace. But you're going to have to allow the Holy Spirit to do that for you. Allow the Holy Spirit to control your mind and it leads to life and peace. Arm yourself with possibility thinking. Now, maybe in a situation today where you say, you know what, Henny, watching online, year this morning, you say, you know, it sounds so wonderful, but, you know, <laughs> but, listen, can we just stop the buts? Please? If ifs and buts were candies and nuts, we all would have a Merry Christmas. Can we just <laughs> stop it? <clears throat> but, stop the but. But you don't. But, but you don't but, but, but you don't know but, but, but stop the butt some of you have too big a butts that you too frequently visit you need to stop that and not but but not but what is possible not but you don't know what is possible when I engage on the level of thinking about a future that I want, not death. I don't want my marriage to die. I want life and peace in it. I don't want my finances to crumble. I don't want death there. I want life there. I don't want my kids to crumble. I want life and peace there. So what do I need to do now? What? Not but what? Do I need to do now to get to the future that I desire, not the fear that I have of what might happen? Amen. Every day of your life, you can live from a place of faith and not fear. But as a decision you make, when you allow the Holy Spirit to take control of the thoughts you think, am I talking to anybody? Yeah. Let the Holy Spirit control your mind. Let's bow our heads this morning. Lord, we come to you today and we just humbly place our lives before you. We ask you that you would help us, lead us, guide us, equip us, show us. We thank you so much that we don't have to walk in shame and guilt. Yeah, we've done some things we shouldn't have done, said some things we shouldn't have said, acted in ways we shouldn't have acted, behaved like sinners instead of saints, thought like people without a God. And then we've come to a place in our lives where it's dead end alley again and again. We can't find our way out. And some of us have had that again and again. But today, help us so we can make the decision to allow you the truth in our hearts and minds so that we can get the change we need, not because of a formula, not because of a system, but because of the person of Jesus. 
Help us to embrace the power you have for us. While every head is bowed and every eye closed, those watching online, please bear with me for another moment. If you're here today and you say, Henny, I've never really made a commitment of my life to Christ. I've never really allowed him to have full control. I'm not talking about, you know, praying some prayer or, you know, and just, you know, kind of feeling, well, I think I'm okay. I'm talking about, you know, without a shadow of a doubt, if you walk out of this building and something were to happen to you, that you would open up your eyes in heaven, that you would be before the one you love and the one you serve. An absolute surety and security of his love and his grace for you. You know that you are born again. You don't think, you don't hope to make it, you know. If you do not have that kind of security in your life and in your heart, then today you can have it. The Bible says, For as many as received him to them, he gave the right to be called sons and daughters of God. So if that's you and you'd like me to pray with you today, would you just pop your hand up and let me see it and I'll pray for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, 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 thank you. I see that God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. I see that back there. Thank you. You can put it down. Thank you. Thank you. I see that. God bless you. Thank you. I see that. God bless you. Thank you. Now, I want to lead you in a prayer. If you're watching online and you'd like to pray with us, would you pray this with us? Let's just pray this out loud. I'm going to ask everybody to pray together. Say this. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. Today, I receive you as the Lord of my life from this day forward. You are in control. Thank you for dying for me on the cross, shedding your blood so that I can be forgiven. Forgive me. Give me that future, that hope that you have for me. I am yours and you are mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. If you believe that, give the Lord a clap offering that he is worthy of today.